My name is Philip Bloom and welcome to this video review of the latest camera from Blackmagic, otherwise known as, is that a black magic in your pocket? My first review of a black magic camera was of course the cinema camera ear version and that went live the morning of the first day of IBC. The reason I know that is because 30 minutes afterwards they announced another version of the camera which is this one, the micro four thirds version of the same camera. Camera releases are happening all the time, it's to be expected especially IBC. So I had to change it, no big deal. But that review was epic. It was around 45 minutes long. 45 minutes, that's ridiculous. Yet around half a million people have watched that review. Whether they watched it all the way through or not, I don't know, but if you did, that's 45 minutes of looking at my face, talking about a camera. There's way more interesting things to watch on TV than that. That's Walking Dead, Breaking Bad, Game of Thrones, The Returned. God, even a Kardashian show would be more entertaining than this. So instead of doing another 45 minute video for the pocket camera, I've decided to cut it down into bite-sized chunks. Well, when I say bite-sized, sort of more like United States bite-sized. No offense to my United States friends. Bigger bite sizes over there, of course. It's gonna be three parts. I'm gonna break it down, which also means I can get it out a lot quicker. So I can get part one out first, part two, part three. It's going to be the first part is going to be this, of course, which is the introduction, the uh, first impressions, what I think about the camera, the problems I've had, what I you know like, what I don't like about it, and what my expectations are. Part two is me going out and using it, which is probably the most important part because it could probably debunk everything that I've said in part one, and I'm doing that tomorrow in the capital city, my hometown of England, which is called London. So I'm gonna go down there and film away and hopefully get some lovely stuff. And part three will of course just be my cats because a review without my cats is not a review. I'm not really gonna have a part three with my cats. They may well pop in. It's gonna be my uh, summary, uh, my you know, closing thoughts, you know, all the sort of stuff you expect in, in sort of like a, you know, a third act. It's got a beginning, middle and end. What more could you want? So I went to CVP in London and picked up the camera from them. It came in a small box because it's a small camera and I opened it up and there it was. Small camera, relatively light, heavier than other cameras of this sort of size mainly because it's, it's metal body. Inside the box we have the camera, a wall charger for the removable battery, which is great, it's removable. It's actually a battery used in the Nikon One series, so easy to get hold of those but there's no separate battery charger, you have to charge it through the camera. And an instruction manual, which of course is of no use to any bloke out there whatsoever. We don't need instructions, we'll work it out, right? So I charged up the battery, turned it on, and really liked the display, really nice. It's funny to see the cinema display from the, well, from the bigger camera on this smaller screen. It's not touch screen, which is actually not a bad thing. I don't really like touch screen. It actually has physical buttons, which I think is much better. So we have a couple of pluses already. We have removal battery and we have a lack of touch screen buttons, much, much better. This is a micro four thirds mount, like the micro four thirds. Where is it? Here it is. Like this camera here, a bit different in size, as you can see. This micro four thirds version though is a 
passive mount. There's no electronics in there, which means you can't use Lumix glass. You can't, which uh, they need power, so they, it's not gonna work. This is an active mount. It's got connections, which is way, way better. So we can use a, well, a Panasonic glass, and because of the lovely small flange distance, which is the space between the lens mount and the sensor, it means we can put on loads of different lenses depending on the adapters that we have. We can put on PL glass. This is the MTF services PL adapter. And we can also put on Nikon one. Here's a dumb Nikon mount. We can put on the speed booster. This is the Nikon speed booster. More about that later and we can put on EF glass. Now you do need to make sure it's a powered EF adapter. There's not many out there. MTF services do one, which is, is quite big for a camera this size. You can get one from Red Rock Micro, hoping that Metabones bring out one as well, because their system is very, very, very neat. So as long as your lens's image can cover the sensor, it's most likely you'll find the adapter for it out there. It's just if there's any electronics, you need to make sure you have an adapter that's gonna work for it. I wasn't expecting to get the camera this week, which meant I really wasn't prepared for it. In fact, I'm supposed to be doing loads of other stuff, but I had the camera, had to do the review, had to get it. Unfortunately, I didn't have any spare batteries, which meant I had to go on Amazon and try and source some more batteries. I found some, spent money. I had to buy quite a few because I need to make sure that I have enough for a day's filming and also make sure they arrive in time for my filming tomorrow. Although the box says it records RAW, there is no RAW currently in the camera. There's no Avid DNX HD either. It's just ProRes HQ. No other flavors of ProRes, just HQ. The camera records on SD cards, not SSDs or compact flashes. It can't fit the SSDs in there, clearly. The problem is it's very, very finickety about which cards it takes. It took none of the cards that I used in there. And these are all very fast UHS-1 cards, SDXC, Transcends, and other brands. And they work fantastically in my other cameras and they're super fast, but they're not working in the pocket camera. No matter what format I formatted the cards in, whether it was um, XFAT or the Mac um, Extended Journal, didn't matter, it just didn't work. So I did a little bit of research online and people were saying you need the SanDisk Extreme Pro, which is a, a 95 megabits per second um, speed on it. And I'm pretty certain I had one, maybe two somewhere. So even though you probably own some SD cards, you are going to need to probably buy some more because a 64 gig card in ProRes HQ is gonna give you roughly 37 minutes or so. And when we get RAW in there, it depends on what the RAW is. But if it's Cinema DNG, people are talking about sort of like 17, 18 minutes on a 64 gig card. I like to go out with, especially because I do a lot of documentary filming, around five to six hours worth of media. So you can imagine it adding up quite a lot. I do have this device here, which is the Nexto DI. Uh, this is the Air one, so it talks to your, your iPod and iPad. Um, and this has a 500 gigabyte SSD in it. Now, you still need more than one card, I would say, but um, I'll be using this because I don't have enough cards. It's certainly gonna be cheaper in the short term than buying lots of expensive cards because the point of the pocket camera is it's cheap. And so you don't wanna spend too much money but the thing is, you are going to have to. It was around 10 o'clock last night when I finally got the camera to record something when I found the SanDisk Extreme Pro card. I was incredibly grumpy by that point and all my grand plans of filming some fancy stuff uh, within the house weren't gonna happen because I was very grumpy because not just the camera wasn't working, I was also having some 4K hell trying to export um, a DPX sequence of a film I shot on the F55, which is gonna show an IBC. So very grumpy and all I decided to just quickly just check was just shoot one of my cats because hey, it's a video review, cats are gonna be in it. Percy, my camera slut friend, he was very keen to be filmed, did a few shots of him and that was it. Bang, done, thank you very much. The way the camera works is so similar to its bigger brother, just without the touch screen and a bit smaller. It has the same menus, it has the same options, of course it doesn't have the RAW etc in it just yet. You can record in film or video mode for the ProRes, film gives you a much better dynamic range, a nice flat picture, don't bother recording in video mode, but you can at least view it in the video mode. 
So yes, yeah, similarities in the menus, but also similarities in some of the things which bug me about the simple operation of the cinema camera, which are also very much there in the pocket cinema camera. Many functions which you should expect and are very much present in every other video camera that I've used or DSLR. That is being able to format a card, being able to delete clips. I also want to know when I'm recording how much time I have left before that camera is going to stop. It doesn't do that. There's still no audio meters on there. So recording audio in camera is just a big no-no until we see actual levels. It's just too risky. It's a game of chance and audio should never be a game of chance. Audio is as important, if not more important than the image. Don't forget, this is only part one of the review and this is just me going through stuff. It's almost like looking at a spec sheet but not actually using it. Once you use it, a lot of these things change and you find ways of working around. So if you think I'm being a bit of a negative Nelly at the moment, don't worry, things will hopefully perk up in part two, but there's still a lot of great things about the camera which I'm gonna talk about now. The camera records in full HD, of course, and it records in 24, 25, and 30p. There is nothing past that, so there's no, obviously, slow motion within this camera. It's rated as having a dynamic range of around 13 stops. I completely believe that because it should be very much similar to the main cinema camera, the bigger version, and that has that same amount of dynamic range. There's a headphone jack on the side, which means you can, of course, put in an external microphone, and you absolutely have to because the internal microphone is absolutely abysmal. The problem is, of course, with the external microphone, you still don't have levels, which is a problem. You also have a micro HDMI uh, socket, so you can plug in into a TV, monitor, EVF, or anything like that. Micro, mini, HDMIs, both of them are not very good solid connections. Hopefully somebody will come out with a way of making that connection a lot more solid. It doesn't have the lovely SDI that the bigger brother has, of course, but you're gonna have compromises. You have to in a camera that size. The sensor size is Super 16, which is smaller, in fact, than the cinema camera sensor. But the thing is, it's actually a little bit more practical because that one wasn't one thing or the other. It was in between sort of Micro Four Thirds and Super 16, which means you could use Micro Four Thirds glass, but not use them fully. And you couldn't use Super 16 glass because it didn't cover the whole of the sensor. This makes more sense. You either go one way or the other, you don't go in the middle. So having it as Super 16 is actually really good. And it means I can use some of my old Super 16 glass just with an adapter like I have on the MTF services here. This is the PL adapter with my Ingenue zoom lens. The thing is, if you are coming from a DSLR, most likely you've either had a full frame sensor or a APS-C sensor, which is like Super 35. So when you get to Super 16, you're in for a bit of a shock in that your light sensitivity won't be as good, but most importantly, your ability to get those shallow depth of field shots you're so used to is a lot, lot harder. Now, personally, I would love Blackmagic to have put a Super 35mm sensor into the pocket camera. They haven't, it's Super 16. Okay, it's fine. So when you look at the competition, so also we have the GH3 with its micro four thirds sensor, and we compare that to the Blackmagic, obviously, this is smaller, but this has a lovely EVF. It has a nice flip out screen. It has a fairly decent codec, which is all lie. Um, it has a average microphone, but certainly not better. And it also takes stills. Not bad at all, really. Uh, something like this though, this is the NEX6. And this is a very, very similar size. In fact, I think they're brothers, but this, has a super 35 mil, sorry, APS-C size sensor. So this is much more sort of like in line with the camera that's shooting me, which is the Canon uh, C100, much more in line with say your 7D. The fact that it's in this little body is fantastic. What this doesn't have that this has, it's not a very good codec. ProRes HQ, AVC HD. AVC HD does fall apart if you try to push it too far. And it is acceptable for a lot of applications, mind you, where actually ProRes HQ is gonna be overkill. In fact, it's so overkill, RAW then would be more than overkill. What's more than overkill? I don't know. It's not really a pocket camera, it may be in size, but by the time you put stuff on it, it's clearly not gonna go in your pocket. You're gonna need, obviously, 
glass sticks out, unless you're going to put on a pancake lens and just live with that, you're going to need stuff which is going to stick out. So pretty much all of my lenses will stick out, which means not in my pocket, in my man bag. Then you need a microphone, maybe a handheld rig, maybe a couple more lenses, tripod. You need a tripod, of course. Audio recorder, you need an audio recorder. But it is really small, and if you do go bare minimum, bare, bare minimum, not worried about audio, and as long as you're very, very, very careful about your stability because of that rolling shutter, then shoot on too long a lens, you are able to get some pretty good stuff in a very, very small footprint. I, for me, I see this camera being, being a B camera, to be honest with you. It's going to be a camera I think I will have with me no matter where I go because it is so small. And if I have an adapter, Nikon adapter, it means I can use the same glass that I use on my different cameras. And that's really important. So if I ever have a camera go down, I have a backup. More likely, I'll find I want to get an extra angle somewhere and I have a camera like this. Very small, you can mount this anywhere. So just in my very limited time with the camera, I have to say, I do really like it. Even though you've just heard me talk about all the problems I've had with it, that's really just about the initial setup and, and knowing what I need to make it work. And of course, the quirks with the menu. Other than that, I do really like the size. And I think I can keep it to a bare minimum with the right lens. And I think something like my Voigtlander 70 millimeter, 0.95 will be a lovely lens to use with this. It's a little bit long, but about the right focal length for a Super 16 to give me effectively that sort of standard field of view. But can I see myself going out with this camera in my man bag when I go out to see friends? Highly unlikely, to be honest with you. I'm more likely to take something like this simply because it takes stills as well. And I don't expect it to take stills because it has a sensor which is optimized for video, and that's fantastic. Whereas this has a sensor optimized for stills which shoots video. It's still really nice video. This shoots better video. This has a larger sensor. This isn't as deep a depth of field. This has a shallower depth of field. This is heavier. This is lighter. This is more expensive. This is cheaper. There's pros and cons for all sorts of things. Really, I don't think this is a consumer camera. I had a semi-Twitter argument, well, an argument, a disagreement where, with somebody yesterday who was saying he thinks this is a great consumer camera, sort of for people who want to shoot a little bit more better video than the normal consumer camera. I totally disagree because I don't think it's a consumer camera at all. ProRes HQ is not a consumer format. It's a high-end format. It requires expensive cards. It requires lots of batteries. It requires a fairly decent setup for editing. It requires backup. It requires lots of backup, in fact. So no, I don't think it's a consumer camera. I think it's a professional camera in the guise of a consumer camera. It looks like one, but I think this is a professional camera. So get all ideas of it being a consumer camera out of your head. Forget about that. This is a pro video camera, just a little one. The thing is, what's it like to shoot with? So that's the end of part one, and part two is the fun one where I go out and shoot with the camera properly. In fact, it's most likely where I will disagree with everything that I've just said to you. snob I just don't like public transport I'm fine if it's like this but when people start getting on it I sort of get a little bit claustrophobic so I'm just gonna just in case these seats are taken don't like it stop those Dutch angles thank you what I love about London places like this is the overwhelming smell of it's lovely you look like you're a bit smudged on the outside of that lens do you want to take this megan fox she can come out of that black hole that'd be fine what a weird quirk <laughs>